on from our webinar series on political success, ensuring relevance of 100% renewable energy strategies in the global south. So before we are starting, just some quick housekeeping rules. Um, I'm Anna Skopfan from the World Future Council, and I will be doing the moderation today as well. Unfortunately, we had some change of plans and my colleague from Fred of the World can't make it today. So as you might have seen, you're all muted um, in the beginning and please keep it that way. However, later on, we would really like to hear your experience with 100% RE strategies and how we can better link up the energy sector to other sectors such as cities, transport, agriculture, industrial development, etc. And for that, um, feel free to unmute yourself, speak or post your comments and questions in the chat as well. Um, so if you have any questions, please type them in the box or ask it later and during that session I just mentioned. For your information, we will record the webinar and also upload the recording to the World Future Council website and also include it in the follow-up email next week. Um, Naimi, could you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So as you can see today, um, we actually had a whole series of webinars in the past weeks, all on paving the way towards resilient, inclusive growth in the global south, 100% renewable, 100% accessible, which is based on the work the World Future Council has been doing with Bread for the World over the past oh, six or seven years, I think. And today we are in the last session. You can see all the sessions on the World Future Council website as well, in case you um, haven't been able to participate. And for our speakers today, if we can go, so um, we have some distinguished guests today. I will be starting with a very short introduction of what actually is a successful 100% RE campaign and what we are doing at the World Future Council and how we as an organization measure success. Afterwards, we will hear from three distinguished speakers from different but very much interlinked sectors. Um, first, Rohit Sen from the ICLE World Secretariat who is speaking on renewable energy and 100% renewable energy strategies in cities. Then Helmi Awolish, um, Executive Director of the SECIM Group or SECIM Initiative in Egypt, one of the largest agroecology food producers. And last but not least, um, Dr. Jürgen Persson from Eurist, who is working on sustainable transportation. And after that, we would really like to hear some of your thoughts um, and see how all this turns out and what your experience is, what you think makes sense to link 100% um, renewable energy to other sectors and how we can actually achieve that in order to keep the relevance and to really make sure that all sectors are on board for a just and inclusive energy transition. Um, we have a short Slido. So if you can join us at slido.com or use the QR code, which you can see here and type in the hashtag 50269, you can see our first question. So here you go, here we are at Slido. And the first question, what is a successful 100% RE campaign? So achieving key performance indicators, whatever that is. So are you, would you be going for a purely numerical way of um, measuring success, a multi-actor partnership, policy change or changes, improvements in the relationship of multi-actor partnership participants, such as civil society and governments, for instance? Um, or would you say that you can't actually define those kind of indicators from these points now alone and instead just go um, for purely geographical and country respective indicators? And currently, we have policy change as the number one. This, um, just for your information, the slider is quite important for us at the World Future Council because it helps us to improve our work. So I really hope to get some good answers from that. We will keep slider open for a bit longer. Um, so achieving key performance indicators is also quite high on the agenda, I would say. So let's see how this turns out. While you can still be continue to do Slido, I'll just hop over again to the presentation. 
and I'm very sorry to have it to, um, to have to do it all now. It's a bit uh, messy and I'm very sorry about that. I'm just quickly hopping to my part of the presentation so we can continue with the more important stuff. So um, I really hope that you can see my presentation now on 100% renewable, 100% accessible lessons learned from the development of renewable energy roadmaps in the global south. Um, so until today, 77 countries, 10 regions, more than 100 cities, and more than 260 businesses have committed to some kind of renewable energy target. Most of them are in renewable electricity, but not all of them. So this is quite an impressive number if you're thinking that six, seven years ago, nobody has talked about achieving 100% renewable energy. And so the obvious question would be, can this already be counted as a success? And while I think it is at least to some extent successful, we still have some issues to solve. So some of the 77 countries committed to 100% renewable energy but as you might be aware, um, not everybody is following through with policy implementation and actually following up on their commitment and pledge to, to a fair and just energy transition. Which um, leaves the question, what actually is political success? How can you measure impact um, and how you measure impact directly relates to what you want to achieve? So examples of shifting power include, but are not limited to, pledges of key targets for your goal, um, e.g. adoption of 100% renewable energy targets, which we have just seen right now, with around 77 countries pledging to go 100% renewable, a new bill or law being passed legislating your goal into reality, policy makers, decision makers treating your goal as a norm, measurements of renewable energy percentages of energy mix, so a rising share of renewable energy in your energy mix over a longer period of time. This year, for instance, um, renewable energy in Europe and also in Germany, where I am based, have been contributing more than half of the, um, or have been satisfying more of half of the electricity demand because the demand actually slowed down due to Corona. Um, Likewise, we also have a decline in the percentage of fossil fuels in the energy mix, obviously. And also policies regulating the use of RE in other sectors could be counted as such. For us at the World Future Council, um, policy reform is really the measure to achieve or to the, the indicator to measure renewable energy change and, and support. So what we have been doing in the past years is um, we have been developing nationally tailored 100% renewable energy scenarios. So gathering people in a multi-actor partnership to discuss a joint vision to co-develop a 100% renewable energy scenario, build capacity to understand what is needed, what are the, the barriers to 100% renewable energy in the country, and based on this, developing a policy roadmap. And this kind of policy roadmap usually stipulates not just the barriers, but also the solutions. What policies would be needed to really achieve 100% renewable energy in the respective country? We have been doing so in Costa Rica, um, Tanzania, Bangladesh, and are scaling that up currently. And afterwards, obviously, we have advocacy and communication, which really needs to be strategic in order to ensure that the policies you have formulated and the findings of the scenario are communicated in a tailor-made way to the respective key audiences. So policymakers speak a very different language than civil society or energy scenario modelers. And we at the World Future Council have been making sure to really try to communicate this in a strategic way. And after that, hopefully comes the policy reform. Sounds easy, but it takes quite a lot of time. And I think our biggest successes so far is that our policy roadmap is being considered as part of the green recovery program in Costa Rica. And also um, that Tanzania, who is, which is currently um, revamping its NDC, is 
or wants to include some of the findings of our technical scenario in the policy um, aspect of the revised NDC. And also Tanzania is aiming to build a wind park, which is based on the findings of this renewable energy scenario. Apart from that, um, we have to ensure relevance, obviously, and that's something where we hopefully hear very good inputs later on from my colleagues from ICLE, SICM, and URIS. So we need a strategic integration of renewables into the climate change and development agenda. And this is not just necessary to, co um, to meet international commitments, but as we can see, uh, renewable energy can really, or is actually contributing to each and single of the 17 SDGs, as you can see here. So for instance, and I'm not going to take them all up now, 100% um, renewable energy can provide reliable access to energy at the lowest possible costs. Renewable energy can actually um, improve cooking conditions by facilitating electrical, co electrical cooking and thus reducing indoor and outdoor air pollution um, causing respiratory disease which um, probably should be easier said than done as well. Obviously also renewable energy is low hanging fruit when it comes to greenhouse gas emission reduction. And there are lots more, which I will not be going in now because um, I really want to take the time to have our speakers talking about that. And with that, we would act I would actually like to go over to my first colleague, to Rohit Sen from the ICLE World Secretariat who is actually working on developing 100% renewable energy strategies in several local, um, local governments in Kenya, Indonesia, and Argentina. Rohit. Thank you, Anna, and good morning to you all. Um, thank you for this opportunity. Um, um, let me uh, first start with my first slide, setting the scene um, so that we just have a, you know, check on what is the ground reality as of now. Um, Anna, could you please go to the next slide? So uh, at the moment we see that um, we have the climate crisis, there is an issue with the energy access and we have limited natural resources. With this, you see this uh, picture where on one side, we still have 1.1 billion people lacking access to energy. Unfortunately, 95% of them are in Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia. And in the middle, you also see that cities which are responsible for 65% of the global energy demand, of which more than 50% of the energy we consume is wasted. And the reality of today is that it's ever increasing emissions level, which are hitting a record high and creating the crisis. So how do we, uh, you know, meet this challenge? There are multiple solutions. One of them uh, that we uh, look at is the solution where, uh, Anna, could you go to the next slide, please? This local governments drive the energy transition. We have seen that various cities and regions around the world are setting up renewable energy targets, committing to 100% renewable energy targets. More than 400 plus cities now at the moment have already committed uh, to this. This includes cities, towns, and regions. And um, why we say this is that local governments being at the local level uh, actually have the pulse of the requirement from, uh, from, from the ground level with respect to the, uh, the needs of uh, the people, uh, what is required, what impacts with respect to policies, they have the unique authorities and so on. And with respect to this, they can definitely set in local RE targets, which can look into public transportation, either uh, having um, e-vehicles or having uh, charging stations running on renewable energy, electricity, uh, in co uh, implementing building codes for green buildings, energy efficiency standards and so on, also for uh, district heating and cooling uh, systems. No? So a few things that uh, the local governments are uniquely positioned to do um, at their level for uh, this 100% renewables energy transition. Anna, could you go to the next slide, please? Looking at what drives them. So some of the key drivers that we look at is um, that they can have more resilience uh, and decentralized energy uh, production. 
Apart from that, the key uh, uh, driver is that there is already um, CO2 emissions uh, reduction. Apart from that, local energy revenue from sales and export of renewable energy, re reduction in um, fossil fuels and uh, indirect impact in air pollution and associated health, health risks, um, create local jobs and stimulate the local economy uh, from local resources and support the achievement of national and international targets, uh, which Anna also mentioned, uh, looking at the SDGs, looking at the uh, NDCs and so on. Looking at this, um, we have uh, been working on um, the 100% Renewable Cities and Regions Roadmap Project, which is funded by the International Climate Initiative, ICI, and the German Ministry of uh, Environment, Nature, Conservation, and Nuclear Safety. Under this project, we look at three countries, nine cities, uh, and try to take them from their current status to reach 100% renewable energy status. We will look at uh, various bankable renewable energy projects and access to uh, finance from public and private sectors. These projects uh, and roadmap would contribute to climate and energy targets, as well as, as I mentioned, NDCs and SDGs. This project will also support local policy development and enhance energy security and improve energy efficiency for the local economy. Above all, this project will foster multi-level governance, policy dialogues, and strengthen capacities of key stakeholders, which is very important for implementing something like this at subnational levels. Next slide, please, Anna. So these were the uh, regions that we are working in. In Argentina, we have three cities, uh, Avalneda, Rosario, and La Plata. In Kenya, we have three counties, Kisumu, Nakuru, and Mombasa. And in Indonesia, we have three regions, um, which includes West Nusa Tenggara, in which Mataram City and Sumbawa regions here are included. So very different uh, regions, very different in geopolitics, in, um, in, in demography, in local needs and requirements. So uh, this also says that 100% renewable energy strategies are all need to be uh, modified with respect to the needs of the local environment. Next slide, please. So now when you start this, you would ask, okay, how do we set an 100% renewable energy targets? So to look at it at a macro level and to simplify it a bit, we speak to the subnational governments and say, let's do it in three steps. Step one, please pick up a scope. Would you like to go ahead and do this transition for only government operations or would you want to do this for a community scale citywide? No? So that depends on what is uh, the capacity, what kind of ambitious commitment they can do and uh, the local setting of the city and the region. Once the, you choose this, then we move to the step, step, step two, which is picking a sector. So either you choose all the three, transport, heating, cooling, and electricity, or you choose at least one of them looking at what is the immediate need, where is the requirement and where you can be ambitious in achieving those uh, sectors and moving to 100% renewables. Step three, in a very simple way, design your roadmap into various uh, phases. So if somebody says we want to be 100% renewables for 2050, then create some sub targets for 2030, 2040, and then you reach the ultimate milestone by 2050. So design your strategies for implementation of projects, and then also create partnerships with people, change in policy, look at various access to finance, uh, transfer of technologies, and also urban rural cooperation, because a lot of times it will happen that the uh, city or the region itself is not able to have uh, or cater or tap into resources, renewable energy resources to cater their own internal demand. So a lot of times you might have to go beyond the region of the city boundary or the region boundary to access um, renewable energy resources from the neighboring regions or the cities. Next slide, please, Anna. So just to see how one city or region might look at into planning, which we are doing um, for these uh, South, global south cities, um, working with our partners as well. We start with from scratch. So first we start from data um, collection, data modeling, which feeds into various uh, energy modeling scenarios to see 
what is the current status, what kind of resources they have, uh, what is the uh, potential of tapping into those resources, and then analyze various feasibilities of, of the pathways or the scenarios that can be tapped into. From those, you look at what kind of technologies that are available locally, which are more impactful and have more uh, uh, effect on being implemented. And as Anna mentioned, policy recommendations. So what policies are there? What policies need to be added or edited for this transition to be more smoother and faster? From this, you create a roadmap for yourself, as I was mentioning earlier, roadmap into various uh, sub-targets and create implementation strategies on how such a roadmap uh, and a transition can be implemented and try to um, draw out bankable projects um, which can be then connected to various uh, project preparation facilities or financial institutions, multilateral development banks, etc., private investors included, you know. And of course, this will include taking in all the stakeholders on the, uh, together uh, along with and having a common understanding between the local government as well as the national government that this is also feeding into the local plans as well as the national uh, climate and energy action plans and that the models that you use to implement such projects, projects whether it is co-financing, blended finance, uh, uh, public-private finance, uh, partnerships and so on, those things need to be uh, made sure that is easily imp implementable and if required, the policies, um, uh, the policy environment is, is, is made uh, available for them to implement them. Next slide, please. Um, okay, I, I had one slide, but anyhow, so one of the, I, I just, uh, um, there was a benefit slide, but anyhow, just, just to uh, highlight that part that there are multiple benefits on, on economy, on, on governance, and, and uh, on um, multilateral cooperation between the two governments. So not just that you boost your economy, you boost um, using local uh, resources from renewables, you stop using uh, your dependence on fossil fuels, uh, which is also impacts your revenue streams. And at the same time, the governance is more transparent for, for the public that you serve. And at the same time, there is more um, communication and partnership with the national government uh, while going ahead with such strategies. So I end there. Thank you very much. Um, and I look forward to further interesting questions from you and conversations. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Rohit. And um, we have enough time if you have any questions and I'm checking um, the chat, but it doesn't seem like it currently. I have a question though, so um, just very quickly because we will have a big, bigger Q&A afterwards. Um, bankable renewable energy projects are one of the main topics we are facing in the renewable energy debate, especially in the global south. So what would you say, Rohit, are there specific um, barriers or opportunities for cities for bankable projects? What, what exactly is your work there? How do you try to ensure bankability of projects? I mean, first of all, this whole definition is, of bankability is very broad and every finance institution, whether private or public, uh, as far as it's a debt or equity investment, they define bankability as far as their own analysis, yeah? So some, people's, some people might have the bankability where more risks can be taken. Some people's bankability can be more um, you know, risk-free. So for, for uh, local governments from Global South, the issue is more to have uh, a structured uh, revenue model as well as to have um, a business model which is solid and can take you uh, over the next five to eight years uh, assurance of revenues and has also uh, uh, you know, formulated um, the gaps of, of revenues in the sense the revenue collection or, or the inflow of uh, revenues could go up and down by 25 to 50 percent for whatever reason, external, internal factors, factors which are not under your control. And at the same time, if uh, um, the local currency, which in most of the global south uh, cities, countries, you will see that the currency inflation um, and the forex, um, uh, the, the inflation in the country and the forex uh, hits them really hard. And, and that's where 
um, the foreign investors also um, are hesitant to take the risk and invest into uh, renewable energy projects in, in countries of Africa, Southeast Asia, and so on. So those are some of the, uh, the, the, the key problems. So therefore, um, the, the local governments with the national government should look at more uh, investor friendly environment, um, perhaps uh, reuse public funds more as risk mitigatory uh, funds uh, to encourage private investors to, to pitch in both nationally, locally and internationally. And uh, of course, uh, create some risk uh, mitigation instruments and insurance uh, instruments that that can Im uh, impact in a positive way uh, to for investors to take up such projects. Um, but yes, uh, business models, financial models are very important, which um, which the technical people implementing those projects um, not necessarily uh, understand the same way as the investors sitting in, in, in the global north countries. So there needs to be that bridge created and, and, and the understanding of uh, the local um, issues and challenges need to be also dealt on the other side as well by the investors. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Rohit. Um, this was really excellent. And I really think that we should talk further about that, um, especially when it comes to bankability of projects. So thanks a lot. And I'll open up the Q&A later on. Our next speaker is Helmi Abolish um, from SECIM. He is the CEO of the SECIM initiative in Egypt and president of the Demeter International. Um, SECIM promotes a sustainable development in ecology, economy, societal and cultural life and is regarded as the Egyptian pioneer in organic farming for which it was also awarded the Right Livelihood Award in 2003. And Helmi is also counselor of the World Future Council and I'm welcoming Helmi. Yeah, good morning, and I'm very happy to join you here and share with you our story uh, in Egypt and in agriculture. And this is a sector which doesn't immediately pop up when you speak about renewables, but whereas agriculture and food, the whole food chain, are contributing heavily to the energy demand and hence to CO2 emissions in the world, I think it's important to, uh, to also take initiatives in this sector. Um, what I would like to share with you is our story. The Jacob story started 43 years ago with the, the vision of my father to establish a sustainable community in the desert based on organic farming, based on what he called economy of love, based on education and capacity building for all of the members of our community and uh, for real potential unfolding of also the communities around us. And this, which didn't seem a very uh, uh, great or successful business model, turned out to sustain all the challenges and has turned into a miracle, what, which nowadays is called Zeker, where 2,000 people work and live together and where we have our own school for 800 kids and our own university for sustainable development for 2,700 students in the meantime, uh, including uh, engineering and the department for renewable energy and uh, hundreds of biodynamic certified farmers all over Egypt and selling 80% of our organic or demeter certified products in the local market in Egypt, where we are the market leaders for herb and tea. So this is the nice part of it. But there was always one issue which, which was very high up on our priority list. It was to prove that organic farming is not only healthier and nicer, but also more efficient and hence more cost efficient and cheaper than conventional agriculture. And in this context, in 20 years, in our university, we issue reports on two cost accounting uh, comparative studies between organic and conventional agriculture. And no surprise to you, when you put in all the externalized costs for CO2 emissions, for water damage costs, and so on, obviously organic already today is much, much cheaper. So this is the nice part of this true cost accounting exercise, but as you all know, the true costing does not change behavior of farmers or consumers in the country. 
it's good for the academicians. It's good for us to know that we are on the right track, but it needs a further step. In 2017, my uh, father, Ibrahim Obelesh, passed away after 40 years of SACAM and after being 80 years old. And um, we, the community, the SACAM Future Council, came together to set up our mission impossible for the next 40 years until 2057. And in this context, we set up a vision for Egypt 2057 and our own goals for SACAM for the next 10 years. And one of them was obviously that Egypt will be 100% organic in 2057, but the other one was that Egypt will rely on renewable energy to 100% in 2057. So we started in 2017 to use more renewable energy. I have to be very honest, until 2017, this was not on our priority list. But as soon as we started in our farms, and in one particular farm, which you will find on our website, it's the Sekem Wahad farm in the desert, in the Libyan desert, the white desert. Um, we felt immediately that there is some, something going on. And today we have there four big pumps, solar pumps with 350 kilowatt um, uh, electricity capacity run by solar energy. And uh, the results were so uh, surprising to us that today we have one mega, 1,000 kilowatt solar panels coming currently to us uh, from different suppliers to go 100% organic in this big farm, which has nearly 2,000 hectares and where a few hundred people live and work. What's, what happened? Now, this is the interesting thing. Um, yes. In, uh, in organic farming, we use less water. This is why we believe we are more efficient, but we still use a lot of water in agriculture as everywhere in the world. And uh, one of the major factors of the cost of water in, uh, in agriculture is energy. And uh, for, energy, for agriculture, it is either you farm in the desert and you are off grid if you're in Egypt, then you have to have a diesel generator to run your uh, wells. And this will contribute to 35 to 40% of your cost. Or you are on grid, you have some electricity from the government. And then it will be maybe 20 to 25% of your cost. Still a substantial part of your cost. And then uh, when we did our uh, renewable energy exercise at this farm, we quickly found out that going to renewable energy and an off-grid position in Egypt makes us much cheaper. So at the moment, we are going to 100% renewable energy, not only because we like it and love it and believe that this is the future of the world, but because we will save a lot of cost. We will get more competitive with our pricing. And this is fantastic for us and for everybody else in whatever farming system he is working. Now, the new thing is that obviously immediately we then started to study how is it on grid in the, for the 7 million farmers who have electricity in Egypt. And you will not believe it, it's the same. Even for an on grid position in Egypt as a farmer with renewable energy, you are cheaper. Yes, there is an initial investment, but you can recover it in three to four years on grid and in two years off grid, which is perfect in the sense that it's an investment which makes a lot of sense. And then forget, obviously you can imagine that currently we are also transferring all of our factories and all of our residential homes into renewable because there the electricity cost is even higher from the government. And so it makes a lot of sense to transfer on grid and off grid. So what I want to say is what is great news for us, for our colleagues, the farmers in Egypt, hopefully, going to organic farming, but for sure going to renewable energy uh, and uh, whether they are on grid or off grid. And then I ensure that as soon as my colleagues from industry and from real estate development will recognize the advantage they can get, uh, then this will be a major game changer in Egypt and I'm sure in many other countries in Africa. What happened in parallel, I have to say, is that 
we are working with our government since many years on the renewable energy. We benefited a lot from the World Future Council material. We have used it in our uh, discussions with the Minister of Electricity. And I think we are very, very happy and proud today that we have a feed in law, a feed in tariff, uh, net metering, and all kinds of uh, tools which we are using now and which enable us to make all these transitions. So the message is, it works in agriculture for us here in Egypt. It will work in many, many other countries in Africa, I'm sure, from the same perspective that real, in terms of real cost, we are simply much, much better off and very competitive. So I'm very, very hopeful and optimistic that we will reach our vision for Egypt 2057, but also Africa will go quickly into a transition to renewable energy. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Helmi. This is, was very an inspiring speech. And I think the vision you have set, 100% organic, 100% renewable, is very ambitious, but it's achievable. And I think it is what we need to actually ensure a future livable planet for everybody and also for future generations. And uh, what, what I found particularly interesting was actually that you said that um, 35 to 40 percent of all costs for off-grid communities are have to be invested into energy, particularly in that case, mostly diesel generators. So that's quite impressive that renewable energy could save much of those costs. Obviously, renewables have some upfront costs, but after that, they are more or less paying for themselves. And what, what I would like to ask here, um, you already addressed solar pumping, for instance. Um, so this is something which has been popping up, I think, in the last five or so years, if I'm not completely mistaken. But I think it's still yet to be a success story as such, like a global success story. So what would you say is needed to make solar pumping more widely known to make it a mainstream in agricultural practices? I think it only needs some case studies like the ones we did and we are now documenting it with the Heliopolis University uh, colleagues to spread the news. We are spreading it to our organic farmer community, but we also will spread it in Egypt to the conventional farming community. And as soon as the people will see the benefits in so clear and loud uh, numbers, I have no doubt that they will switch. So that it's not a very difficult call at the moment in Egypt. And uh, I think it's the same everywhere else. If renewable energy has a fair chance and subsid uh, subsidies for electricity uh, or other energy uh, um, carriers will be reduced, and this will happen anyhow, everywhere in the world, then the renewable energy will prove that it's very competitive. At the same time, I have also to say, of course, costs went down dramatically over the last years in every single regard, whether it's uh, photovoltaic or wind energy and many other things. So I think that it's an easy call from our nowadays perspective, even in the global south, even in Africa, even in, in Egypt, even for farming, to go to renewable energy and, uh, and uh, do something very good for the world, for the climate, but also for your visibility and livelihood. Thanks a lot. And I would be really interested in receiving uh, the write-up of that report. So. Once it's finalized, please send it my way because I think it will be very helpful for us as well, um, especially when we are talking about countries like Nepal, Vietnam, or also Uganda, who are relying quite a lot on agriculture. So solar pumping is something we definitely need to talk about. And this interlinkage of agriculture, water, and energy is one of the main topics which has to come up in the next, well, actually, it should have been coming up already, but it definitely has to come up now if we want to ensure a life for future generations. So thank you a lot, Helmi. Um, if you have any questions uh, to the, um, if the audience has any questions, please feel free to type them in the chat and I will get back to them later. And in the meantime, I would like to invite our last speaker for today. Um, Dr. Jürgen Persson is the Vice President of EURES, the European Institute for Sustainable Transport, where he focuses on the relation between transport, CO2 emission reduction, um, poverty alleviation, and development goals. So uh, 
Jürgen, I will share your presentation and I'm looking forward to your input. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Anna and everyone to join this uh, interesting meeting this morning. Uh, my presentation will be very practical. Um, I'm a little bit in the direction of uh, Helmi and I appreciate the very complex approach from Rohit. I think uh, this can can be combined in, in, in a way that we know on, on the one hand that we have to follow a more holistic approach where we work with communities and governments and also to work with a bottom top approach which is uh, at the moment the approach we are doing. You see um, the presentation here, um, we are uh, heading towards uh, the establishment of a social business model with uh, zero emission e-bikes. Um, we are starting in, in, in Uganda, Namibia, and we are um, also trying to extend our work to other countries on the African continent. However, this is not only limited to Africa. I think uh, the general um, idea of our work is to combine the mobility sector and the re renewable energy sector because we we see that the mobility question in in a continent on a continent like africa has to be solved we have to work towards a um transformation of the transport sector maybe you can give us the next slide anna um and uh, this is just a short introduction you can read it meanwhile i'm talking um you know that the, the the car fleet in the world will double until 2050 and three or four cars will probably be um registered in africa of this uh, um, increase and so there there are no politics there are no standards there there's a little um in terms of initiatives uh, to work on this question of uh, sustainable mobility However, we have for the discussion about the transformation uh, of the sector in, in many countries in the world. We are still following this car-centered approach. So we, you can give us the next slide, Anna. Um, we, we, we ask ourselves, is it time for electric mobility revolution in Africa? Um, and this should be based, of course, on renewable energy. Um, we have started a pilot project in Uganda uh, in 2017. We finalized that project in 2019 in cooperation with Sun Cycles Namibia and Fabio in Uganda, first African bicycle information organization. And we are in close contact with the Siemens Stiftung, uh, GIZ and uh, UNEP, um, because they are also, they had their first um, e-mobility workshop in Kisumu last November, where we participated and uh, the whole sector is now on the move and uh, i think we are at a very decisive junction uh, worldwide uh, and also africa wide um three weeks ago the um, unep um, african cycling alliance was uh, was founded in nairobi on an online uh, seminar and uh, we are working with uh, with this question in a bottom top approach um can you give us the next slide and I give a little bit the background. I think many of you already know that um, uh, African foot is produced by mainly by women. Um, very many women in, in Africa are uh, owning small enterprises, middle enter sized enterprises, and they also take over up to 90%, depending on the country, uh, of the household transport burden. So we think that transport is here a real bottleneck for development. Um, next slide, please. Then when it comes to uh, jobs in Africa, we know that the young generations, they are really looking for jobs in the transport sector worldwide is giving a lot of jobs to people. And uh, we have given out already uh, bicycle ambulances and we see that motorcycles and, and all these kind of uh, transportation options, they, they are already very dominant <clears throat> in rural and in urban Africa. And uh, we, we have done some research on, on how bicycles are used. And we always find that uh, they have a limited radio they it's very exhaustive um, the capacity is is limited and so on and so we think e-bikes could make sense so next slide please um, then when it comes to the social sector um, we uh, we believe that um, bicycle ambulances can also save lives we know that um, maternal death rates and uh, uh, small child uh, death rates are, are also very high still. They are already going up again in the corona uh, crisis, uh, what we uh, identified. And um, we tested some of these ambulances in the rural settings of Uganda and uh, we had tremendous success. Um, people were really enthusiastic in, in all directions. Maybe another next slide. 
Um, so each of our bikes we distributed in the in, in the region uh, traveled over 10,000 kilometers in one and a half years. I covered up to 40 kilometers, not 20. This is a, the typo here. Uh, every day um, and then we also had a, a lot of um, a lot of positive response from all types of, of users and we had especially we had uh, per bike we had up to 12 users so once the the taxi service was done then somebody went to the market or another one brought somebody to the medical center so the, these bikes were were heavily used um, and so much appreciated that we thought we have to go one step further. This project was financed by Rotary Club we uh, in, in Hamburg, and uh, this was just a pilot project. So next slide, please. Um, we can, I think we can skip this because we are a little bit running out of time. We made some some uh, research on the impact and we saw that people increase their incomes. People use the bicycle taxi, uh, the e-bike besides a bicycle taxi service for many, many other purposes. So it has these, had these multiplicator, multiplicator F effects. Um, next slide. And, and also we, we, as I said, we had a positive um, impact on the income and the radius. Uh, people said that their life um, has been improved. The living conditions have been improved because it's not so exhaustive anymore. Um, next slide. So um, we, we saw already the 17 SDGs this morning. Um, and to uh, summarize, uh, we, we can say that e-bikes could, could uh, contribute to different different SDGs. Um, I think it's it's very clear, at least uh, I would say they could contribute to, to 10 of the 17 SDGs. Um, and especially, of course, in our context this morning, um, it is about green energy, which we need to um, assure to load these batteries um, to get them running up and down. And uh, so we, we at the end of this project, 2019, we thought, now what can we do? There are no e-bikes in Africa on the market. We have developed some few in our project, but of course they are much too expensive as pilot uh, vehicles are always, uh, prototypes are always very expensive. So next slide. So what we, um, I think you can go through this slide uh, quickly if you, um, because they are coming some of these um, columns. We have some time, so don't okay. be pressured. Yeah. So um, what we what we did, we uh, pr um, we wrote a proposal to the German government to um, uh, give us some uh, funds to develop uh, specifically um, uh, uh, e-bike, which is specifically designed for the African market, which can be repaired by local spare parts, uh, which can be used by men and women, which has high loading capacity and, and all these these th very important things and um, of course uh, we had to look for the um, solar technology uh, which is available in, in the countries and how do we have to design the batteries and the loading system and so on so um, indeed we uh, were successful with this um, we received um, funds to develop a completely new e-bike um, and including um, 80 um, prototypes or 80 newly designed e-bikes. And with these uh, e-bikes, we would like to establish a social business. Um, all of them will be uh, um, driven by solar energy. Um, maybe you can go through this slide because there are coming some few um, boxes. So um, yeah, you can um, put some more. I think there is uh, and one more. So the the overall goal is that um, these e-bikes will be uh, able to be purchased by um, small, by, by microcredits, by uh, small amounts of money, which has, can be paid uh, uh, through um, pay and go through mobile money. And we have already identified microcredit institutions. Um, we are doing this in the first the first country. We will do that is Uganda, but this is uh, not the, the end. We have already requests from Zambia, Rwanda, uh, Namibia, Mali, and, and Niger. Um, if you if you look into the boxes, you see that of course we are creating a new market. We are creating we are connecting mobility and energy. We are uh, we are creating probably uh, a number of new jobs. Um, we will um, increase uh, the range um, of travel options uh, in the rural areas. So we also contribute to local integration. Um, we 
will work on the environmental side because we will deliver emission-free logistics um, to markets. Um, and of course, what we what what is very important, we we increase um, uh, south to south knowledge exchange and transfer because um, there are already some uh, solar experts in the countries. We uh, are training our bicycle experts. Um, so um, I think it is, it is one option that the markets uh, will um, develop without very much uh, intervention from, from, uh, from external um, parties. So once the, the thing is running and you can order these e-bikes, um, then uh, markets, uh, I mean, um, these uh, social business models can, can work. And um, there are already um, some uh, solar containers uh, established in some countries. We have just talked to um, partners in Rwanda and in Mali. They say that uh, solar panels on the roofs of people, they are somehow not really used. 60% uh, of the energy is, is, is not used by people. So, and at the same time, they have a, a gap in mobility options. So we think that this is a perfect um, um, option to fill the gap. And I think you can go to the next one. This is the overview um, of our project. It starts this year. Um, it is funded by the KFW and uh, our main partner in Germany is um, uh, the design manufacturer uh, HNF. It is uh, based in Berlin and uh, south of Berlin. And uh, another partner is uh, the biggest um, bike factory in India and in, in the world. It's uh, Hero, based in Delhi. Um, we have a, another German partner and we have uh, uh, for our first implementation, um, the first African Bicycle Information Office in, in Uganda. Then we have uh, uh, some other actors and partners in the solar sector and uh, also the scientific um, part will be taken over by a partner here in Hamburg, the Technical University of Hamburg, um, where we cooperate and uh, do a very, um, uh, cl very clear um, evaluation of the project in, in the next in the next months. Um, the bikes will come uh, in mid uh, 2021. And now we are preparing the country um, to host these bikes on several spots and we will probably um, then have a, a very good outreach with the results. That's that's what we are doing right now. So we are we are having this. I, I can tell you this. You are the first ones who actually um, receive this information because it is everything is brand new. We have just um, received the information from the German government that we can go ahead. The bike is already uh, pre-designed. You can go to the next slide. Uh, you can see it here. It has a design. Um, uh, a little bit uh, like um, a little bit like a motorcycle, I would say. So you can see the carrier on the back uh, side of of the bike, and uh, the um, bike will not be named bike because uh, we have uh, consulted our African partners, and they believe that the bicycle has a poor image. And if we call it differently we, with a new branding, we will probably. Um, have a better approach to people who don't want to cycle because it's called bicycle and this bicycle of course will be fast it will go 30 kilometers per hour it has a loading capacity of 100 kilos and the range of around 50 kilometers and then you have um, to uh, either you have to reload the battery or you have to uh, replace uh, the battery so we are also working on a battery swapping system um, I can talk a lot about the different areas where we will use this bike. We will use it for women groups, for water transport, we group uh, in the agricultural sector for transporting um, um, harvest, and of course uh, in the transport sector of bicycle taxis, then in the tourist sector. Um, this will be also one, uh, one area where we will test these bikes. We have many tour uh, hotels who are interested um, to uh, work with these bikes. And finally, in the urban delivery um, area where we think that they can also support urban uh, logistics based on renewable energies. So this is our bottom top approach. We have, of course, the expertise and capacity to work 
uh, also on the policy level. We have uh, a lot of contacts, uh, at least in Uganda, to um, make sure that from the need of the people um, to use bicycles and uh, e-bikes, we have to uh, reach a level of um, commitment of the political leaders to also to invest in um, cycling mobility, infrastructure, safe roads, and to achieve a policy reform. So um, we did that in the last 15 uh, years. We worked a lot with also with other partners, with universities, with UNEP, UNDP, and different countries um, to establish a policy uh, which is cycling friendly, walking friendly, but this is a very long process. And this approach is uh, not the top bottom approach, but the opposite. And we we will see where we are in two years from now, when we are delivering bikes and getting hopefully a positive response also uh, in the media. So the whole thing um, hopefully will be a booster for um, sustainable mobility in rural areas and in urban areas. I think that's it for the moment. You can go to the next slide. Yes. Um, so results and more information will come in 2021. Um, and if you are interested, you can, of course, uh, um, send me an email. Our new website, african-ebike.de is uh, under development. It will be um, online on December 1st. Um, so everything is brand new and uh, yeah, I, I'm happy that I could tell you this story this morning and uh, looking forward to your comments. Thanks a lot, Jürgen. This was really excellent. Um, so first of all, uh, congratulations to the new project. I think so, this is really excellent. And I have a question, if you wouldn't mind. Mm -hmm. What will the bikes be called if they're not called bikes anymore? Yes, um, at the moment, uh, our teams in uh, Namibia and uh, Uganda, because it's not that the Europeans um, should um, define the name. It should be defined by, uh, by of course, by the, by the local experts and the users. And we thought about um, the electric lion, which is uh, called in, uh, in the local language E-Zimba. This is at the moment the working title. But we are not at the very end of this story and yeah and maybe also of interest uh, anna and and the others here in the in the chat um, is what about the costs how much is an e-bike and you know that e-bikes in europe you don't get some below 2000 euro and uh, we are heading um we are heading 500 us dollar which is a fantastic price um and with uh, uh with the microcredit you can pay off an e-bike in 24 months and then it's yours. And if you compare the situation where uh, taxi drivers, motorcycle taxi drivers, they never own their motorcycles. They pay much more um, and they never own it. And when it's broken, the, the story is over. Um, of course, the e-bike is not completely uh, a competitor, 100% competitor for motorcycle taxes. We need them as well. And I think we need e e-motorcycles, which are also um, loaded by renewable energies. But this is something where, where we thought uh, others can also do that one. And we have a contact to Bodawerk in Uganda. They are doing that right now. They have already won a prize. Um, for us, it's about uh, um, the level below, um, which can also be used by um, households in both rural and urban areas. Yes, thanks a lot. Um, I will definitely get back in touch with you. Uh, as you might know that the World Future Council together with Pet for the World and WWF started a project in Uganda on 1% renewable energy for the national level. So I'm sure we will um, we will talk later. I'm just seeing that Rohit has to leave us, unfortunately. Yes, um, I, and I have to drop off now. But I have just one question, quick question to Jürgen, uh, and, and create a very interesting concept of, and thing that you're working on. Just in case the, the load was more, I don't know how, what is the calculation between one person putting the energy and force and effort with the load of 100 kgs to a max that one can carry. But I'm just thinking that what about the design for a tandem where at least instead of one, maybe two can drive uh, in, instead of car, for cargo loads or something. I mean, you know what I'm talking about, like the tandem bikes, you know, where instead of one person, two can push it through. 
might be interesting or is it too difficult to design? Um, I, I think there are many, um, many designs possible and we are at the beginning of this. I think we can design uh, tree cycles which are driven by electric uh, energy. Uh, we can design um, specific trailers. Um, I think we should take the people from where they are now. Um, and nobody is uh, riding a tandem in, in the regions I have been to. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, design-wise, it is uh, complex. I'm not a designer, but I know that uh, the frame size, weight, the torsion on the different parts of the frame, when you break with two people riding, then you have much more uh, impact on the on the braking system, on the fork, uh, you need a suspension fork. Um, it increases the weight. Um, when you have more weight, you have to, there are so many different, uh, we had a quarter of a year, we just discussed every day with the technical experts in the design company, all these issues. The engine size, the battery size, the loading system, the, the, the size of the different tubes and, if we want a unisex frame and then also for a tandem, you have to see what, how, how you design it, that it can be used by men and women. It's, it's a very specific question, but I think uh, what we know is that Hero is extremely interested to bring this um, sector further. So once this model is successful, then they are interested to design other models, maybe for urban context, for the urban commuter, who is a bit older and has a little bit more money, he wants a more fancy bike, which is faster, but he doesn't have to have to transport so many things. So um, we have to think uh, uh, this is not the end of the story, it's just the beginning and it's a basic model, I would say. And then from there we go. All right, thank you very much. Very interesting, all the best with this uh, launch on Dece in December. And uh, thank you enough for this. And I look forward to being in touch with both uh, the presenters as well. Uh, perhaps something that we can look at doing together. But thank you very much. And if there's any questions, please do forward it to my email. I'll be more than happy to answer them. Thank you a lot. Rohit. Thank you, Rohit. Um, a follow-up question to what Rohit just asked, because I think it fits pretty nicely. Um, do you have e-bikes that can go through hilly places, considering the topography in some areas in Kenya, for instance? Yeah, we um, actually we are working uh, with a project in Rwanda, and Rwanda is also a very hilly place, even more maybe more hilly. Well, there are also hilly places in Kenya and everywhere. Um, and uh, our engine is. Um, of course, strong enough to climb up hills, but it's a matter of, um, um, I think, of the, the radius, the range of a, of, a, of, a, of a motor. Probably we need um, another model which is specifically designed for very hilly areas um, with a stronger um, engine and with, this, uh, with a battery with more capacity. Uh, the model we have, um, probably will better work in flat and partly flat, partly hilly areas. So if there are small hills, probably possible. And you always can, it has 14 gears. So if there is um, need to assist by pedaling, it is always good. You can always pedal, then you save some energy. And if it's too hilly, you, you, you and, and, and the last kilometer you cannot manage anymore, then you may have to push, but that's something which is, of course, beyond uh, the next phase. I would say we are starting with a number of, uh, with uh, some containers um, in, in the countries we are active now. And of course, we are open to, to look for other uh, options and, and partners. Um, but at the moment, they are running into our doors and we have to be, be careful to really to select what is the easiest way to get um, also data. I think we need data. And this was the first issue on the slide of uh, Rohit this morning. Um, the, the, the thing is, we need data on, on this project. We, we have this idea, we have this e-bike now and the solar technology combined with that everything is, 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 uh, is now um, in the planning process for implementation in mid of 2021. But then we have to create the, the facts. And then we go for other areas as well, probably.
Thanks a lot um, for replying to that question. I got another question in the chat on um, actually for Helmi, but maybe Jürgen, you might be want to chip in uh, afterwards. Um, so we have been talking about solar pumping and basically the food production side in your presentation before. Do you also see opportunities for renewables along the whole um, value chain and supply chain of food production in Egypt? Or are you really just focusing on the production? I, I, as I said, I see a lot of visibility for renewable energy for the whole uh, food processing, which mm -hmm. is uh, the big sector employing a lot of people in Egypt in uh, small and medium uh, and large size companies. So there is a lot of potential. I see a huge potential for all kinds of commercial enterprises, whether it's wholesale or retail shops, malls, whatever because they pay a very high price for electricity. For them, it makes a lot of sense. Obviously, the space and the ability to put solar panels will have to be studied, but yes, there is a potential. And we are just now starting to test e-vehicles in SECAM. The first e-car we just have bought this year, and now we are going for e-buses and e-trucks, e-bikes, and so on. So, I'm also interested in all this presentation on the e-bikes in Africa. Also, in our case, it, the case is different and we have not a lot of mountains, so we are <laughs> happy on this side. So, uh, yes, I think in along the whole chain, for all kind of purposes, uh, renewable energy will get more and more uh, importance in Egypt. I mean, um, to contribute to what Helmi said, I think um, I have been to Egypt. Actually, I cycled through Egypt a couple of years ago and I saw the situation. And th there are still bikes underway and the distances are sometimes really long. Um, of course, there is a question of infrastructure and road safety in Egypt. It's a very dangerous uh, country. Um, but of course, we, we have to work on that. And uh, there are also some areas where it's not so dangerous to cycle, for instance, and uh, the, the bike uh, is very important in marketing uh, food crops and in going to fields and uh, even in, in uh, we, I had a colleague who wants to uh, make a mobile water pump with, uh, with, the, um, with the battery I don't, and with a, uh, with a solar panel which is installed on the bike which you can unfold uh, and then you, you pump water. Yeah? with the energy. So there are many things um, we can talk about. So if you are willing to, to um, look on that question, we are open for that. And we too, so I'm in contact with you. I please, I don't you have contact. your email. Yeah, please do that. Mm -hmm. I will do so. That's excellent. So we are already connecting the sectors here. Um, too bad that Rohit has to leave, but there was another question. Um, I know that SECAM is also working or yeah, is doing some projects or looking into urban gardening. So as you might be aware, Helmi, and for the others, the World Future Council has been working on renewable energy in Bangladesh, a country where the dirt is underwater for most part of the year. Um, agricultural land is sparse and, as I said, often flooded. So I was just wondering what kind of, um, of possibilities you see here to, to combine this aspect of urban gardening, urban, urban agriculture and renewable energy together, which might be a bit a uh, step too fast now, but maybe you already have some ideas here. We are working on aquaponic and hydroponic organic solutions. And all of them are more energy intensive than ordinary farming in the fields. So they need energy, they need renewable energy. At the moment, we are uh, researching a German uh, light, uh, a photovoltaic module, which you can use also as the, as the roof and ceiling for a greenhouse. And uh, yeah, a lot of opportunity. Also in this field, even more than in ordinary uh, organic farming. I was muted. Okay, that is really interesting. So I will definitely also get back in touch with you and also put you in touch with our colleagues in Bangladesh, particularly. 
um, once the situation is cooling, being cooled down. So for the audience, if you have any questions, please um, type them in the box. Otherwise, we are actually close to the end anyway. And we have one more slider question, which I will be showing you just a second. So what are the main drivers of RE in your region country? So I think today we have heard three excellent inputs um, on renewable energy in cities, renewable energy in agriculture, and also renewable energy in transport. And as we have just seen, all these sectors are intrinsically linked. And I am very interested to hear what your experience has. Um, we had a colleague from Kenya who also just published a renewable energy scenario, as I have read in the chat. So besides um, answering that question, do you want to maybe, oh, I can't see the chat now, so I can't uh, look up your name again, but if you want to say something about your experience of renewable energy in Kenya and cities, uh, agriculture and transport, that would be great. Justus? Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, I am. And thank you so much for this, uh opportunity that you have given me to share some of the experiences. As you just saw in the chat, we we managed to launch 100% um, renewable energy scenario for Kenya by 2050. And uh, in this um, report or scenario, we have just been able to, to focus on um, just several things. And I shared the link with you for maybe your uh, more reading or details because the the report gives an overview of the situation in Kenya in terms of energy supply and demand, also the potential that Kenya has. And uh, as you know, in Kenya, we have much potential in terms of um, um, the resources that we have. And this includes the, the biomass, the biogas, wind power, solar power, geothermal, and to electricity as well. And therefore, out of the experience in this, we have just been able to consider the energy efficiency and the demands for this country. And this report has been able to alight and, uh, into different sectors on the demand and supply that is required. And I'm grateful when I've heard about the e-bikes and all that because it's part of um, the interventions that we need in order for us to be able to achieve 100% uh, renewable energy transition by 2050. And um, that is under the transport um, sector. Other sectors like agriculture, we also have been able to look at the solar farms and what are the other accessories into this. And therefore, um, just to, to share some of the things is that in this, we have been able to uh, work closely with the local communities because that is where the, everything is um, emanates from because at the national level or as technocrats, the governments will be able to come up with these scenarios and all that. But for us, we are more focused to be to the pro poor or vulnerable communities. So therefore, we have also been able to develop a catalog that will be able to share or to give more information in terms of the solutions, the energy sustainable energy solutions and uh, we want to develop that even uh, as an app on a mobile phone such that everybody can get into um, can get in, into the app and be able to identify which is um, the best the best solution energy solution and the where the delivery models the financing models and all that just as a way of promoting the um, the energy uh, access to to the rural uh, people or communities so those are some of the things that we've just been able to, to do. We are working together with the governments. As you had um, uh, Rohit talk about the three counties, we are part of this as well um, in terms of promoting and also coming up with the renewable energy uh, cities and regions. But also, as we are more um, focused on the grassroots, what the common person can benefit and how they can just be able to um, 
to understand and get skills and technologies which can help them because that's where more people get uh, challenges in terms of energy. We are not more so focused on the, 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 um, the bigger government projects because they take time, but the small, small technologies that are locally found by people and trying to empower them uh, with the skills and the technology transfers that they can, we can enhance the object on the set. Thank you, Eustace. This is really interesting what you have been doing. And thanks again to all our speakers. And for that, we are actually um, at the end of our webinar today. As I said before, we are recording it and we'll send around a follow up email with the recording and also the slide. And everything will be uploaded in addition at the World Future Council website, um, where we also have uploaded the previous webinar. So you can have a complete look at what is needed to ensure a just transition to 100% renewable energy, starting with a participatory energy modeling, going over multi-actor partnerships and the relevance of inclusive decision-making, especially in times of Corona. And now going into linking renewable energy to some of the key sectors, such as agriculture, cities, and also transport. Thanks a lot. And if you have any questions, please feel free to drop us an email. Thank you very much. Bye.